My slide changer is gone. <laughs> okay, I'll do it by hand. It's okay. So thank you very much. Um, you'll all be relieved to know that I am not going to sing or dance. You're happy, you should be happy to hear that. That's supposed to be a joke. <laughs> In any event, uh, I appreciate all of you being here today for uh, the, this late in the day, actually, um, this late in the day for uh, a technical talk. So this is going to be kind of a change in gears. You had some introduction already to heterogeneous catalysis and the complexity of the nature of those kinds of reactions. So first I want to introduce the team and I want to point out that this is a very interdisciplinary team and in fact we all need to work together in a multifaceted way to solve these complex problems. And I also want to acknowledge to begin with the generous support of the U.S. Department of Energy. So to begin with, I want to just motivate why we're interested in the work that we are by presenting you with at least my view of what some of the main problems facing our world today are. And looming large, as, as I show in the middle, is basically the energy security and climate change of the world. And we've been hearing a lot about that recently at the UN. There's been quite a lot of discussion and with a wonderful speech by a young woman from Sweden. And what I'd like to point out today is how heterogeneous catalysis has the potential to play a very important role in solving this particular set of problems in order to increase energy efficiency in the way we make chemicals and also in uh, the way that we use energy. So the energy landscape has been changing dramatically. This is a showing from 1850 to a little over uh, 2005. And you can see the change in the type, way energy is produced and also, also the amount of energy that's used. And so in, of late, in particular, in this uh, last century and in this century, Fossil fuels have been the major source of energy production and, and energy use. However, the renewable energies, for example, shown in uh, green and also uh, talking about biomass, they have been on the increase, and in particular solar energy use has been on the increase over the last few years. But there's a challenge presented with these renewable energy resources, and that's the fact that they're intermittent. And you're very familiar with this in Germany, wind power is another example. But if we take solar energy, even in a sunny place like California, you can see here as you look across the time of the day that the solar energy flux varies dramatically. And so one of the challenges is not only to produce energy, but to be able to store it in some way and there are many different approaches to that. One, of course, is to develop batteries that can store this electrical energy, but also one can imagine, as you heard about today, storing that, that energy in the form of chemicals. And that's the approach that we take. So chemical production, as you heard already uh, in one of the earlier talks, the introduction of the Unisys CAT system, uh, production of chemicals takes up a huge amount of the percentage of energy use worldwide and only a few chemicals, in fact, are used uh, to produce many other things, including fragrances, flavorings, fuels, insulation, everything that we use on an everyday basis. And so here's a very simplified network of some of the most intense, uh, energy-intense processes and largest scale processes in the world. And these processes, production of these materials or transformation of these molecules, all rely on catalysts, which are very complex systems, and most of them on heterogeneous catalysts because they're easily separable for industrial applications. In our EFRC, we're actually focusing, in this part of the spectrum, where we're interested in producing and transforming alcohols. I'm sure that you'll all be doing that later today when you're having a few drinks because ethanol is in it. You'll be oxidizing it. That's biocatalysis. But in fact, methanol and other alcohols are important chemicals for producing lots of different process, uh, products that we use on an everyday basis. So what we're interested in doing is to try to understand how heterogeneous catalysts work for certain key transformations and so here's kind of a schematic of our approach. And, and here, if this is supposed to be the holy grail, what we're after 
is design principles to be able to tell us how to make more efficient catalysts that can provide more sustainable routes for making chemicals. And so we are interested in not only making catalyst materials to begin with, that's part of the, the, the challenge that we face, but also in understanding the interplay of reaction conditions and catalyst materials. So in particular, the need to activate materials and transform them into actual functioning catalysts and to keep them from deactivating or losing their activity over time is a really critical part of what we're doing. And we're trying to use a variety of different approaches to develop a fundamental understanding. So we're basically trying to build a foundation for understanding heterogeneous catalysis processes. And specifically, we're interested in thermal processes, ones that are, uh, in, that are induced by heat. Our approach, is, I'm not going to go through it in detail, but it's a multifaceted approach. You saw the large team of people working on this problem. The important point is we have several different uh, approaches that we take in our work, and that it combines theory and experiment in order to be able to develop these design principles for efficient cat catalysts. And I'm going to basically give you a couple of vignettes or illustrations of the kind of work that we do. And here's schematically what we choose to do. We take very well-defined systems that are models where we can know where atoms are with atomic precision. We can describe them using theoretical models, a model so-called uh, using a technique called density functional theory. We then use that to understand what reaction pathways occur. So you saw, for example, in Arne's talk, the different chemical steps that he outlined for the reactions that, that were demonstrated, we try to pick those out for these complex systems and measure the, the rate at which they occur and under very well-defined conditions. Then we try to use that fundamental knowledge to design an actual working heterogeneous catalyst. And I'm showing one example here, one that I'll talk about. It's a dilute silver and gold porous catalyst, so-called nanoporous gold. And you can see if you look at a larger scale, this is about a 10 micron size particle. It's about the width of your hair. But if you zoom in further and further resolution, you can see manifestations of the atomic planes in this material. So it's a very well-ordered material, and we can therefore make this transition across the level of complexity from a model system to an actual functioning catalyst. And so the example I'm going to use today is selective oxidation catalysis. It's one class of reactions that is very important in chemical transformations. And these are the examples I'm going to take. What I'm going to show you is that we are able to scale across these vast ranges of complexity. So for those of you who are experts in the audience, we can go from fundamental surface science studies all the way to operating reaction conditions with a functioning catalyst that's very stable over time. Because again, we want the catalyst to function not just for a short amount of time, but continuously, ideally for decades, if you're going to use this in a process. The other uh, illustration that I'm going to use is to show you how we understand the structural transformations and the compositional transformations in complex catalyst materials. And one of the messages I'd like you to take away today is that even solids, these catalysts, are very dynamic entities. So that the atoms are coming and going on the surface, they can change and be adjusted by your reaction conditions. And that's one of the things that we strive to understand, how those changes occur in a dynamic way so that we can exploit that to have long-lived catalysts that keep regenerating the catalyst site. So that uh, even though these are solid materials, they're very dynamic and flexible under the conditions of experiments. And these are some uh, pictures of the, some of the catalysts we use. I've already mentioned the nanoporous gold, which is the first example I'm going to talk about. But then I'm going to discuss a new class of materials where we introduce an oc metal oxide support, which is one of the complexities in catalysis to understand that interplay between a catalytic particle and a metal oxide support. So the first example I'm going to take is the case of oxidative coupling of methanol. 
And schematically, what we do is we use experiment to obtain a reaction network, very much like you saw in Arne's talk. We use theory to try to help model those elementary steps and understand bonding, then do a kinetic analysis, and then predict reaction selectivity under reaction conditions. So the idea is to develop a general model that under one set of conditions, and then to be able to predict how changing reaction conditions and the material will change the overall selectivity. And we've been able to do that first by starting with foundational work on uh, well-defined systems. And so I'm not going to go through every single step. It's very late already in the, in the afternoon. But basically what we can do is identify a catalytic cycle. And so one definition of a catalyst, as you heard at the beginning, is that it doesn't get consumed or generated in the overall process. So if we start, in this case, with a gold-based material, which is what I'm going to be talking about, there's this set of elementary steps, molecular transformations that occur. And in this case, our desired product is something called methylformate. It's used in uh, insulation materials and in, in fragrances and flavorings, these, these classes of molecules. But a side product is carbon dioxide. And that's undesirable. You all know that carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. So you don't want to take something useful, for example, methanol, and transform it into CO2. You instead want to transform it into something of higher complexity and higher value. But we can determine these, uh, this network, the rate constants, and also understand, under idealized conditions, how to have very high selectivity for the central and desired path. And we measure these rate constants, so we get a network. And from that, we want to understand how to design a catalyst material. We are very interested in gold because it gives us very high selectivity, but you must have oxygen on the surface of gold in order to get it activated. So what we do is think about how it is that we can induce dissociation or activation of oxygen to get the reaction started without then going to non-selective reaction. And so the overall principle that we use is to have a minority active metal, so we're looking at two component alloy catalysts that will initiate a catalytic cycle, but then the selectivity can be propagated or imparted by the majority. And so shown schematically here, what I'm going to tell you about is nanoporous gold initially, which has silver as an impurity. Silver will be able to activate O2. If you have pure silver, you won't get the same product distribution. The selectivity changes. And in particular, under the conditions of these reactions, you would get a lot of CO2 production. One of the other points that I want to make that's shown kind of schematically here is these materials restructure. And I'll come to that in the latter part of my talk. So again, coming back to this material, we have this minority silver that activates oxygen. Without that silver, you can't get O2 to dissociate on these materials. They're nanoscale materials. And the other point is that we have no metal oxide support. So we can only understand how the alloy catalyst. So we sort of deconstructed the catalytic material here. So what we can then do is look at it as a catalyst. So these are just data showing you that you make product. This in blue is methyl formate. And this is shown as a function of time. And in fact, we can run this catalyst for months without losing activity once it goes into this so-called steady state or sort of very flat behavior in terms of production. But notice that in, at the beginning, it doesn't give us this high selectivity. Instead, we get some CO2 and we get uh, this period where we have to get the catalyst activated. And so I'll come back to that. One of the things that we need to do, in fact, is to treat this material first with ozone, and then during the reaction stream, we end up getting this product. But in the end, we have a very stable catalyst. And just to show you how stable it is, the blue curve is a catalyst that we took out of the reactor. It sat around in air on the lab bench for about four months. We put it right back in the reactor, and after a short activation period, it comes right back up. So it shows how robust this material is, and that's very important for making a viable catalyst. You could make something that's a wonderful catalyst that only lasts a few minutes. That's not of practical importance. Now, one of the things we want to do is bridge 
our model system to the more complex chemistry. And one of the things that is very different about the two kinds of uh, studies that I showed is the pressure and also the temperature. And so we use a transient technique and, uh, to be able to bridge these pressure and temperature regimes. But what I really want to emphasize here, because I know it's late in the day and this may be a little more detailed technically, is developing new methodologies such as this pulse transient method is a critical part of advancing science, not only in catalysis but in other areas. And in fact, uh, that's something that I think many people are familiar with in this room, but I want to emphasize it. And this transient technique is an example of bridging across these pressure regimes. And what we can do is, again, make measurements of product distributions. I'm not going to discuss that, but we have a lot of detailed kinetic information from these transient pulses. This information then can be used in combination with the reaction network that we saw in our model systems to predict reaction selectivity. And so with this curve, basically I'm showing the uh, products formed as a function of temperature, so for two different temperatures, and for, as a function of the amount of oxygen on the surface. So if it's red, that means there's a lot of that product form, and if it's blue, it means there's less. And you can see that depending on the pressure and the temperature, that you end up having very different product distributions. So there is a pressure and temperature effect, but it's one that we can understand from the fundamental mechanism we obtain at low temperature. And in fact, we can predict from the, the uh, model that's the reaction model in, in conjunction with these transient measurements, the reaction selectivity under the conditions where we made measurements shown in these dots. So we can do a, a very accurate prediction of the regimes in which we'll see the different products. And so we can kind of roughly divide this up into a regime where you'd see CO2, that's undesirable, and a regime where you'd see methyl formate, which is very desirable product. And under yet different conditions, you can also make formaldehyde, which is a simpler product. So this is all the same catalyst nominally in terms of the material that we start with, but the reaction distribution changes because of the fact that you are changing the concentration of different intermediates and therefore changing the rates. And so the point that I'm trying to make here is that we can take our understanding from very fundamental chemical studies and translate that into an understanding and prediction of an actual working catalyst under atmospheric conditions. And in fact, we've extended this recently to the liquid phase as well. So it's an, it's a, an example and an illustration of how we can use these fundamental studies. I'm gonna uh, skip some of that um, to be able to predict things and to generalize. And so, for example, in this case, I'm basically just again showing you product distributions on model systems versus working catalysts. In this case, it's for coupling of two different alcohols, so it's somewhat of a generalization of the reaction I showed. And so it, it illustrates how this isn't just con confined to one system that we study in detail, but we then can predict what happens with other materials. And in this particular example, we use theoretical studies to be able to tell us that, in fact, weak interactions, Van der Waals interactions, are very important in determining that reaction selectivity. So this is something that, again, biological chemists think about, that weak Van der Waals interactions are very important in determining reactivity. This work actually done in con conjunction with Alex Tekchenko, who at that time, when we first started this work, was at the Fritz Haber Institute, um, shows, in fact, that as you change alkyl length in the uh, alcohol reactants, that you change the binding energy and the orange part shows you the contribution of the Van der Waals interaction. So it shows how these weak interactions, even in a heterogeneous catalyst, are very important in determining reaction selectivity. We further can generalize this. So one of the things that chemists do, for those of you that are uh, not chemists who are in the audience, is we like to take a simple, specific model and generalize it to other systems. And so in this case, where we looked in detail at this methoxy which comes from methanol coupling to formaldehyde on the surface to give us that methyl formate product, we realized we could think of this in terms of an electron 
rich center attacking an electron deficient center, and we therefore were able to generalize this to other kinds of coupling reactions on the surface. We took this simple model, predicted the reactions, and then in fact studied them. So in one case, we looked at carbonylation reactions and another amide synthesis. So we were able to go beyond the one simple case. So not only to predict selectivity quantitatively, but also to predict and discover new reactions, again, on these silver gold catalysts that I d discussed. So rough, but summarizing what I've uh, gone through, and I know I went through it in a very superficial way, but it's backed up by lots of detailed studies, is that first of all, if you, you can control the active site and identify the active site. In this particular case, on the silver doped gold, you must have oxygen on the surface, and the silver, in fact, is critical towards, uh, for forming that active site by dissociating oxygens. We can use our model studies both to predict new reactions, it's a new paradigm, and also to quantitatively uh, predict what kinds of other reactions may occur. And then finally, something that was very surprising when we first did this, we now incorporated into all of our simulations, is that weak interactions are very important in determining reaction selectivity in these materials. So now what I'd like to do is just talk about changes in catalysts. So again, this is this very important take-home message that if you make a material, it isn't necessarily a catalyst. You have to think about what kinds of reactive processes you want to occur, and you have to think about the state of that material or de define the state of that material under reaction conditions. And that's typically not what you start out making at the beginning. And I know this is a... Uh, uh, subject of interest in Unicat and Unisys. So the two cases I will talk about, I'll, I'll pick up on this nanoporous gold case as one example, but then I'll talk about more recent work in hydro hydrogenation catal catalysis where we have an oxide-supported uh, palladium gold alloy. And the main message is um, that we have to determine ways in this case to get the minority impurity metal, which is only there in a few percent, on or near the surface in order for it to affect reaction. And so that turns out to be critical in terms of activation and deactivation, and we need to define what the surface structure and the distribution of those atoms are as well. Again, to do this, tool development is very important. We use a variety of different tools, including X-ray techniques um, and also electron microscopy, where we can visualize individual atoms to be able to understand how materials evolve. So to basically look at the composition dependence of the surface under various conditions. And one of the things that we found is, in fact, kinetically trapped or metastable phases are very important in determining catalytic activity. So I'm gonna come back to this nanoporous gold example because it's one that we understand quite well and again, focus on this early time. I said that it was an excellent catalyst for a very long period of time once you got into this regime where the products are all basically stable. That's called steady state conditions. But initially, first of all, we, have to, we found we had to treat the material in flowing ozone to start with in order, we thought, just to burn off carbon, but it turns out it has more effect than that. And then even after that, there's this initial period where we see a lot of CO2 production before we start to really see a significant amount of methylformate. And it turns out this is due to the catalyst restructuring. So first, when we oxidize with ozone, you can, we use electron microscopy and a tool called X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy under the conditions where we have reactants present. And the, this is a schematic of what we observe. What happens is the ozone because silver oxygen bonds are more strong, will segregate the silver to the surface. It makes nanometer scale patches of silver oxide overlaid or embedded in a gold oxide. And so if you look at the electron microscope image, the surface looks relatively uniform, but if you can look carefully, you can see that it's a little lighter than the inside. So this is looking at one particular ligament. And that's because that material is oxidized. And the silver, even though it's only in bulk percentage, 3%, is basically all pulled up to the surface. 
And we, I know that from the spectroscopic results. We then can selectively reduce the oxide on the gold. And you can see that again in electron microscopy, the oxide's gone on the gold. But if you look really carefully, you can see some little particles that form on the surface. And that, those actually are silver-rich particles that also still contain some oxygen. So you have oxygen remaining, and the silver partly recedes into these particles, but it's still enriched and it stays localized in a nanometer scale regime. Ultimately, as we run the reaction, if we further reduce it just in pure methanol, what will happen is these little patches of silver-enriched alloy particles precipitate on the surface. If we go through this process, then they recede back in if we include oxygen. So under steady state conditions, we have a silver-gold oxide that's actually, uh, sorry, silver-gold alloy that is actually the catalytically active material. In steady state, if we just look at the, in particular, silver to gold ratio, you can see that it is very low, but it's still substantially higher than the 3%. So the picture is, as shown here, that the silver remains localized on the surface. And the, the, we know this from this combination of electron microscopy and, uh, and uh, X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. In addition, we've collaborated with theorists, so the role of theory is very important in understanding this. And, in, and what was determined is that the silver-gold alloy, consistent with our experiments, leads to a, a dissociation of O2. So you have to have the silver present, and importantly, you must have multiple silver atoms. If you just have a single silver atom on the surface, if it were isolated, you do not see O2 dissociation. So that why, that's why it was very important that we concentrated the silver in these nanometer scale patches. The point is that this combination of measurements using imaging and spectroscopy and then complemented by theory is very important in understanding this restructuring. So hopefully I've been able to show you how the catalyst is really a dynamic material, especially when you have these multi-component materials. And I want to again show you we can generalize that and to show you a different system where we're interested in looking at palladium gold alloys from the perspective of hydrogenation. So in hydrogenation, what you want to do is to be able to add hydrogen across carbon-carbon or carbon-oxygen multiple bonds. And in this case, where I'm showing you um, a triple bond going to a double bond, you want it to be able to stop there. You don't want it to go all the way to the next step, and that's one of the challenges that we have. Currently, this process is, uses just a straight palladium catalyst, but it leads to non-selective pathways. And so we've been investigating palladium gold and palladium silver catalysts, but mainly what I want to show is, again, these materials are very dynamic in terms of their concentration of the minority atom palladium on the surface. And the palladium is necessary in this case to break the HH bond of hydrogen. So just like the balloon experiment, we have hydrogen and we have oxygen. It's just that we're uh, not actually exploding a balloon. We're trying to use it for directed chemical processes. So um, this is just a comparison of one of our palladium gold catalysts. You can see that it's very selective. Ideally, you'd like to have only the one product, one hexene, produced over all conversions. And the black shows that the palladium selectivity degrades, whereas the palladium gold does not. And the specific catalyst we use here is a remarkable catalyst that's synthesized by my colleague's group, Joanna Eisenberg, using a novel colloid templating procedure. And so the idea is that you start with a polystyrene bead. You can then precipitate catalyst nanoparticles on top of that, and then get these materials to form an ordered structure. So you have um, a self-assembled structure that then is backfilled with an oxide precursor. The polystyrene is burned out, and so you're left basically with holes. But the important thing is that the catalyst particle is partially embedded in these oxide frameworks. So we have a porous oxide now with nanoparticles so we can have more efficient use of the precious metal that we're using in this case. 
The particles are just a few nanometers thick, and this is just showing elemental mapping that shows that the palladium and gold is distributed in all of the particles that we have in our catalyst. This is, these are just other electron microscopy images showing the same thing. So again, I want to emphasize that imaging, where on one hand we can look at structure, these are different length scales. This is looking at the pore structure. Here you can see the individual uh, nanoparticles, which are six nanometers across. And this gives you elemental mapping, in particular the gold and the palladium on these materials. We also use a, an x-ray technique, and I wanted to mention this because uh, Yanis Timoshenko, who is currently a group leader at the Fritz Haber Institute, worked on this, where it uses uh, neural networks or machine learning to be able to extract information from an x-ray scattering experiment to give us detailed information about the coordination of palladium in these materials, both inside the structure and on the surface. So all of these advanced tools are very important, and I want to emphasize that for catalysis research. What's amazing about these materials is how, again, thermally stable they are. This shows you an atomically resolved image of one of the nanoparticles in this matrix. This shows you that basically the particle size distribution does not change over many months of use um, under reaction conditions. And so this is one of the important factors in terms of identifying an effective and uh, good heterogeneous catalyst is that it will maintain its structure and its activity over many, many cycles. Again, I want to come back to this point about activation and deactivation. This again shows basically that nothing changes over time. These are in situ or in operando microscopy studies done by Eric Stack at University of Pennsylvania, who's part of our team. Again, showing that the particles don't change over many, many cycles even in the presence of oxygen or hydrogen treatment at high temperatures. So for an electron microscopist, unfortunately, this was kind of boring because nothing changed. But from the point of view of catalysis, it's fantastic. So um, the important point here is that we can actually cycle the catalyst under different conditions. So again, if we treat an oxygen, um, what we're showing here is a treatment as a function of temperature and gas pressure. In the black bars, it then shows the activity for these hydrogenation reactions. And what you can see is that we can actually dial in the activity. We can activate the material, so get very high activity. If we treat in hydrogen, um, especially hydrogen at high temperature, it basically eliminates the activity. We can bring it back by treatment again at high temperature with oxygen. So we can cycle these materials in terms of their activity, what we wanted to do, and what we've been working on, is understanding how they restructure. So the point is that palladium in gold, if you have a completely pristine material, prefers to be on the inside of the particle. But if you oxidize, you can in fact favor formation of a palladium oxide that's, again, just like in the silver gold case, segregates that palladium to the surface. So it causes restructuring. But what's interesting is that once we cause that segregation, as long as we pick a reaction temperature that is not too high, we can trap that palladium in the near surface region. And that's basically what we see. We see a very robust catalyst. <clears throat> I'm going to kind of skip ahead because, again, in the interest of time, but in terms of summarizing, if we go to high temperature, under reducing conditions, palladium will go into the surface. Oxygen will cause palladium to come out. Also, carbon monoxide will lead to favorable uh, segregation of palladium on the surface. And so we can basically dial in the composition, and that's what leads to those changes in activity, is changes in the composition over time. And so if I schematically showed this, um, and this is basically a schematic, so I took an actual electron microscopy image, but schematically put the palladium atoms in there. We so far cannot resolve individual atoms. That's a, a kind of challenge in this case to, to see exactly where every atom is. But if you start with the pristine particle, most of the palladium is inside, so that doesn't lead to an active catalyst. If we oxidize, we can bring that palladium to the outside, making an oxide. And if we reduce it under low temperature conditions, that palladium much of it still remains on the surface, and so that's our 
selective catalyst. So we can sort of shuttle back and forth in this case. I wanted to leave you with kind of a picture that shows that this, um, these effects are not just dependent on the size of the particle, it really depends on the composition, so the temperature and the composition and the structure that you start with in the particle is very important. And also to say that methods development for theoretical methods to accelerate the discovery of new materials is very important. So we've been working with <clears throat> Boris Kaczynski, who's an ma applied mathematician at Harvard, um, to try to develop high, highly efficient molecular dynamics simulations that is combined with DFT and machine learning to model restructuring of materials. And so I've talked a lot about the static picture, but I want to basically just leave you with this movie, which is a molecular dynamics simulation of a palladium particle that initially has the palladium exposed to the surface. Um, as you heat up on, and it's on a silver surface, you can see how the palladium, hopefully you'll be able to see how the palladium changes over time. So that it shows you how dynamic these materials are. What you can see are pits developing in the silver as silver climbs on top, and these are actually experimental images of this. And so you can see over a very short time scale, on the order of microseconds, you get this capping of the palladium on the silver. So I want you to kind of think about that visually of how these materials change dynamically over time. So I'll leave you with the key messages that I hope I've been, um, conveyed today, um, which I'll, are summarized here. Importantly, I want you to take away that these are very challenging problems. It does require a team of people. It requires new ideas. There are a lot of younger people in the audience. Your ideas and creativity, not only in terms of methods development, but also material synthesis, and just in conceptualizing what directions we can take in solving these important problems in energy and the environment are really important. That kind of innovation is the most critical for everything that, that we are going to try to do to solve these pressing problems in energy and the environment. So I want to come back and say thank you very much, especially for staying late on a Friday afternoon. Um, I pre really appreciate the uh, opportunity to come to, uh, to Berlin. It's one of my very favorite cities and to talk to all of you. So thank you and again thank you to the team of people who stands behind all of this work. <laughs>